Hello, welcome to our YouTube webinar dedicated to airborne infections and the corresponding uh, <coughs> prevention. This is Christian Stempf, a hygiene advisor to the Damnage Group. Uh, um, what is the agenda of today? The agenda is obviously um, some figures, some data. Uh, confirming that um, dentists and their staff are intensely exposed to aerosols and therefore airborne infections. We will um, also touch on uh, hand hygiene because uh, this is directly linked to uh, airborne infections. And then we will talk about uh, masks and HEPA filters which always refer to particle size of 0.3 micron. And I ask myself the question, what about nanometer size viruses, which are much smaller? How can they be trapped or filtered? And then we talk about ventilation systems, including HEPA filter uh, the units. <clears throat> so at first, some uh, rough figures on the uh, environmental contamination. For example, in a shopping mall, you would uh, measure in one cubic meter of air, roughly four million microorganisms. Obviously outside on the street is by far less than that, 88,000. And uh, on the, uh, in the forest, on the beach, it's far less. It's a nice place to go for jogging, not in the city, <laughs> I would say. Why is it so high uh, in a shopping mall? Because the more people, the higher the contamination. What needs to be understood is that um, every individual releases you know, particles and therefore microorganisms, believe it or not, is between 100 and 5,000 per minute. Where come? How come? This comes from skeins. Skeins, this is a nails, hair, bristles, and also from nasopharyngeal droplets. You know, when we sneeze, we drain 40,000 droplets. Uh, coughing is a bit more of around 1,000. So we <clears throat> contaminate the environment. So the more people, the higher the contamination. And uh, early in March, I lectured and showed this um, uh, record from the NHK Japan. It's a very nice um, movie sh that shows um, the aerosol. You will see these guys sneezing quite strongly, I must say, and you can see that the biggest particles they will drop straight away. But when we talk about aerosols, we talk about particles, droplets of a size less than 50 micrometer. And these aerosols will be suspended for quite a long time until they will settle. So they will also travel around the room um, before they settle. This second video shows two guys chatting in a room <clears throat> at a distance of one meter. And as you can see, this also produces uh, sparks, uh, droplets, and aerosol. This camera can capture very little, tiny, small particles, which are suspended in the air. This is shows, simulates one person sneezing in a room where other people talk, chat. Okay, We see here, um, this is in, in hours, in minutes, sorry, 12 minutes, 30 minutes. So after 20 minutes, still, the aerosol issued from that one guy are traveling around the, the area. So all the other people are breathing in this contaminated air. This graph shows how far particles can travel, depending on the airflow. And the, the weight, the size of the particle, it can be, it can move up to 100 meters. So all the surrounding area is absolutely contaminated. Now, microorganisms uh, on humans, this big number, this is actually the number of microorganisms inside and outside our body, 
it's called 100 trillion. Where do we find them in our intestines? Obviously, most of them are good to us because we use them to digest our food. On our skin, this is a barrier that protects our skin from uh, intruders, if I may say so. Okay, And the same in our mouth. 10 billion on average in our mouth. So the mouth is a nice place to live for microorganisms. They can replicate very easily. It's warm and, and humid. There's food and drinks. Fantastic for them. Again, most of them are good to us. They pre-help pre-digesting our food. But in one ml of oral mi microflora, we can find also 100 million pathogens. We find streptococci. Okay, there are many, but mainly streptococci, 60 million. And I recently read, this has to be double-checked, but uh, when a person has the first signs of COVID, on average, in one ml of saliva, there are 158,000 viruses. Now, we get closer to um, dental treatment. This is a study from the UK where they tend to measure the contamination, putting an agar plate at one meter of the patient's mouth, another one at two meters. And this is the graph that shows, this is the curve of the total contamination. It goes from 1,500 colony forming units. Okay, the, on the aggregate you see this small, these white dots here. This is a common colony, it could be can from one or more bacteria. So the important thing is to see that it moves from 1,500 to 6,000. After the treatment, it will settle. Okay. And then second treatments, these are called aerosol generating treatments. Another video that I found that illustrates that dental treatment are generating a lot of aerosols, especially using high speed hand pieces, turbines, uh, doing scaling, they produce um, a high volume of aerosol and as you can see from that uh, second part of the video that it travels around the chair so it will cover it will contaminate all the instruments which are very close close by the dental chair okay, here this study talks about 20 times after or during treatment the increase of the uh, aerosol so bear in mind that around the dental chair there should basically be nothing or whatever is uh, on the bench move it further away or put it inside closed drawers so during treatment there must be really nothing around the chair you can see uh, this study here which confirms that uh, at a distance of two meters the area is absolutely heavily contaminated This is also available on our website. This compares the um, turbine versus a contrangle in terms of uh, aerosol emission. During dental treatment, of course, these uh, instruments are air driven, for the turbines are air driven. It's about 35 to 50 liters of air. It's a bit less with a contrangle, uh, which is moved by a motor but still is between four and eight liters per minute of compressed air. So as you can see, this will pressurize the, uh, the patient's mouth and generate this high volume of uh, aerosols. How can we tackle this or reduce this? You will see by using a, um, a suction tip. This compares the two uh, hand pieces. This is a turbine. This rotates at 400,000 RPM and produces a lot. And here you see, with the suction unit, you can drastically reduce the uh, aerosol that is produced. There are some hand pieces <coughs> which uh, provide a low air emission. This depends on the design of the hand piece. Um, if they are nicely designed, like high-tech turbines, 
you will benefit from a lower air emission also from the head of the turbine. These small things we, will, we are going to see now help reducing the uh, generation of aerosol and therefore the risk. These are the um, airborne infections, including obviously COVID-19. And there is more to read on our website. If you go on our video channel, you can see, for example, uh, documents PDF on aerosol contamination. And don't forget, we have AIMS, our platform that guides you through the reprocessing circle of Udenia instruments. Now, to protect ourselves, I, I know we talked a lot about masks, we got kind of bored, but um, for information, I'm teaching uh, very often to dental assistants. I see more than 500 a year, and I saw uh, during the um, end of last year, I saw about 200, and so I challenged them, asking which kind of mask are you using? Have you moved from surgical masks to FFP? And uh, now, therefore, I think it's good to just refresh our memory on what does this mask do. Starting with surgical masks, they will only protect in one direction. They will not protect you, the one that wears the masks, but protect the uh, patient. <clears throat> there are four types. One are 2R. These are the best ones, okay, because they offer a fluid resistant uh, shield that will protect you from inhaling big aerosols, okay, big droplets and splatters. But the limitation is three micron meter, three micron. So any airborne particle, which obviously contains uh, infectious agents, will not be filtered. So you will breathe in. Uh, during the procedure, potentially uh, pathogens. <clears throat> this, in addition to a very loose fit, uh, we'll see in a, in a couple of minutes uh, precautions, because of the loose fit around the nose or when you're talking, uh, they cannot provide a complete protection. So back to my question to the dental assistant, 60-70% um, of their practices, doctors move from surgical masks, each of these very good reasons, to FFP masks. FFP, this uh, concerns the European standards, um, and um, they offer a very nice facial um, tightness, and they will filtrate bigger particles. So they protect both the wearer and the patient from inhaling infectious agents. There are three classes, FFP1, 2, and 3. Uh, let's focus on FFP2. And as you can see, FFP2, this corresponds to N95. They will block or filter minimum 94%, this concerns FFP2, and 95 for N95 or KN95. And FFP2, they retain 99% of particles uh, above, this is a mistake, above 0.3 micron. Sorry, this is a mistake, it's above 0.3 micron. I will come back to this 0.3 in a second. You have noticed that there are some with and some without exhalation valves, so which one should be used? It's very nice to uh, use exhalation valves because they will make it easier to uh, exhale. However, this will not filter the air you are exhaling. So it's not nice for uh, the, let's say, the environmental contamination and for your patients. So I would recommend to use FFP2 or 3 masks without exhalation valves. Now back to this question, 0 0.3 micron. This was in the agenda. Okay. This is the size of a coronavirus, and this is the size of 0.3 micron. You have noticed that when we talk about uh, HEPA filters, and I will come to this in later, we talk about 0.3 micron. When we talk about like a sterilizer as a bacteriological filter, we talk about 0.3 micron. Why do we refer to 0.3? If small viruses, including corona, can pass through, they have a smaller size than uh, the 0.3 micron. Look here, this shows uh, the 
0 0.1, 0 0.3, this is the area, so they will filter above 0 0.3, but what about what is below 0 0.3? This is the answer now. Particles um, smaller than 0 0.1, 0 0.3 are so little, so light, that they get bounced around, hitting you know, gas molecules which are in the air. And therefore, they will not travel like a straight direction or a slight curve, uh, which could be trapped uh, by the filter. They will move like a random uh, zigzagging inside the environment, you see. So now how can the mask filter such very small nano-sized particles? And this is called, uh, you have impactation, you have uh, interception, you have different layers on the mask here. You have electrostatic uh, layers as well, and they will trap very small particles. It's not the case of a two or triple layer uh, surgical mask, as you can see here. Now let's think about these tissue masks which, which people wear. I believe it's never nothing, don't get me wrong, but for then practicing, you must wear FFP masks. So it sounds strange, but it's easier to filter particles bigger than 0.3 and smaller than 0.3. This kind of, um, um, how to say, uh, size from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, this is called um, the most difficult size, MMPS, most penetrating particle size, sorry. <clears throat> so if a, if a mask, and this is a test of different masks, N95 masks, and this shows the filtration, you will notice the mask feels much better below and above these MMPS size particles here. So this is the most challenging part. Precautions. Before you put on a mask, obviously you would perform hand hygiene. I will come to this in a minute. And perfectly fit surgical or FFP masks. And as you can see here, this is a mistake because the person has not properly put the elastic band above the ear. We often see uh, people who would twist the elastic band because they, they say it fits better, it holds better. The problem is, it creates kind of loose feet and uh, open door for you know pathogens to enter. The air you're going to breathe is not going to be filtered. And you can see such mistakes, okay? People would not put um, their mask on the nose. Okay, one would think uh, I breathe in with my mouth, but there's always a little part that is taken from your nose. So this is a big mistake because you're not protected. Men with beard, this is also an issue because you have a really loose fit here and um, you should look for an even you shave yourself so you would look for different types. When you put on a mask, never touch uh, the front part with your hands, but grab the, the mask uh, on the bands. Then you firmly fit it to your face, you squeeze the, the nose clip. And then you check the tightness of your FFP mask. It's very simple, without touching the mask, you're breathing strongly, firmly, and you can feel around your face if there's some air that is entering the, the area. Uh, and you see also a deformation of the front part of the mask. Now, it's very important to uh, follow these instructions, and I invite you to read the instructions of use, especially for FFP masks. On average, the manufacturer would tell you eight hours of continuous use, which means if you have not touched the mask, uh, you can wear it for eight hours. After eight hours, you have to change your mask. It's three hours for a normal surgical mask. Obviously, as soon as you touch the mask, 
as soon as you remove the mask back on this picture you must change your mask so it means which means basically uh, you change the mask between patients unless you keep it on for almost half a day <clears throat> think of protecting your your eyes uh, also from small droplets and aerosols hand hygiene obviously hand hygiene is directly linked to uh, uh, aerosol why because when our souls are gonna are gonna settle we could touch surfaces contaminated surfaces and then bring our hands to our mouth or nose or whatever this is the average count um, of um, medical personnel this is on one cubic centi uh, square centimeter from 10,000 to 1 million colonies on one cubic centimeter and we think we distinguish two uh, contamination the transient flora and the resident flora obviously between patients you would change gloves this is obvious to, to all of you what you're going to do after having removed your gloves if I asked the question to my 500 dental assistant they would answer I wash my hands yes in some countries uh, by law you have to wash your hands but this is a big mistake maybe an update an outdated standard or guidance because when you remove your gloves your hands are not dirty so you should disinfect your hands because inside the gloves which you have worn for one hour half an hour one hour the bacterial count has increased so you have to reduce drastically reduce this contamination so what you would do once you remove your gloves you disinfect your hands and you wash your hands when they are dirty obviously first thing in the morning after the toilet as soon as you you know went for lunch or then you wash your hands if they are dirty there's one ex exception though if you use powdered gloves then your hands are always dirty and you have to wash them every time between patients this is a pity because you are gonna damage or remove the lipidic protection we have on our skin which will protect our skin from any bacterial attack okay so uh, don't wash like too often you have to watch if you wash your hands you first have to dry them properly before you apply the uh, hydroalcoholic solution because if your hands are wet it's going to dilute the solution which is going to be less efficient nice to recommend as well as we talk here about reducing the risks is to ask invite your patients to also perform hand hygiene obviously they would wash because you don't know what they have touched they would wash their hands dry their hands disinfect their hands nice to do look this is an example of a dirty contaminated hand this is the uh, sampling before cleaning after cleaning obviously we have removed the transient flora the superficial flora and then with the disinfectant we are gonna uh, bring it down to a very low level of bacterial count now funny picture you remember this at school <laughs> i was amazed because i showed this to my little assistant and um, they tell me they told me that it's still in some schools it is uh, used it's, it's terrible because uh, you're going to use this uh, many people are going to use this soap and sometimes when it gets older it's going to be dirty with crevasses and uh, so you have worse hands after cleaning than before cleaning so this was the the joke dispensers should be automatic you know avoid to touch even the, the tap should be uh, also um, automatic use uh, not too much soap and use um, gentle soap with a neutral ph and cold water don't use warm water because this is gonna is gonna dilate skin pores pores which is an open door for microorganisms to penetrate your skin 
and obviously therefore never never use hot air dryers because they heat your skin number one but they will insufflate all the environmental uh, contamination into onto your hands and into your skin this is the worst you can use i know you see a lot in airports and, and, and stuff like this but uh, i never use hair dryers i use cold water and a little bit of soap then i don't scrub my hands you can think of damaging your hand your skin you pat it dry with a single use paper tissue and then you are good nice to do uh, when you watch television in the evening put cream on your hands uh, maintain your hands it's fantastic okay now pre procedure measures we talked about reducing the risk why not uh, using a mouse rinse <clears throat> You know, it has been proven, there's a lot to read on the internet, that uh, performance hydro uh, uh, rinsing solution uh, will lower uh, the content of microorganisms. This for 30 minutes, because after use, of course, patient will produce new saliva, uh, and therefore the, the, it will be like before mouse rinse. But it's nice to do for your patients, ask them to rinse with a performance um, solution. This is the case and since the COVID pan pandemic uh, many uh, countries recommend to implement mouse rinse, pre-procedure mouse rinse. We have some countries, Germany, the UK and so on and more and more countries are coming to this conclusion. It's a very economical way and smart way to reduce the uh, the bacterial count in a patient's mouth. I also invite you to watch uh, the webinar of Dr. Gassman. You can find this on our video channel. He talked about aerosol in prophylaxis and he also recommends the use of uh, mouse rinse. Watching for evidence. Um, I found this on the, on the internet. I make it very short. Uh, these liquids have a sustained effect on reducing the salivary SARS-CoV-2 level uh, in patients. So this is very important, but not only, you know, some of these solutions, and this is given by the manufacturer instruction of use or uh, data, are effective not only on viruses, but also on bacteria. Nice to have is enveloped viruses, because this concerns the most uh, virulent viruses, COVID, hepatitis B, C, and HIV, but also non-enveloped viruses. So it's nice to have um, such a product. And the same study recommends or thinks it's a very nice idea, useful idea to use mouse rings uh, for pre-procedure measures. Another idea, why not using a rubber dam isolation? This has been used for decades, you know. Uh, it has been first introduced by a young uh, dentist from New York and um, his concern, he couldn't sleep. He was really stressed uh, about saliva contamination and he was thinking, how could I get rid of this or reduce this saliva contamination? And how can I get my you know, treated area dry? And he was the first introducing this uh, rubber dam. Then it has been improved over the years. Uh, then the, the clamps came into, into play. And uh, this is very nice. And uh, you better see also the treated area. You often hear that uh, you better see you do, bet, do better what you see and see better what you do. This is the, the phrase. It will also protect patients from ingesting, inhaling dental fragments or instruments and also uh, irrigating solutions and substances. It's nice to have for the patient as well. It protects their soft tissues, you know, gums, tongue, lips and cheeks. I like studies. This is from uh, from Japan, and they wanted to measure to evaluate the change in atmospheric bacterial population. So they focus on bacteria, not viruses. 
But uh, when we talk about bacteria, we talk about basically uh, uh, particles suspended, aerosolized particles. To make it very short, they use 10 and 10 children uh, with and without rubber dam insulation, and they use a hair, air turbine, including a high volume aspiration. They sampled at 1, 2, and 3 meters from the dental chair headrest. What was the conclusion? This is quite significant. At 1 meter, they measured an air reduction of 88% in the bacterial count with the rubber dam compared to without rubber dam. At 2 meters, it was only, if I may so, 72%. And at three meters, it was mm, no, not relevant. But it's huge, 88% at one meter. Another study for the same purpose. So there were two kinds of uh, investigations. The one um, was made with 16 people, and they, they performed uh, this test with the uh, restorative uh, treatments with amalgam and composite restoration. Half of them with obviously a rubber dam isolation and half using a cotton roll isolation. Both included a high volume suction. The second uh, test was made with 10 participants and here they used a handpiece and air water syringe spray. Again half of them with rubber dam, half with cotton rolls. What was the conclusion? They used four samples. They put four plates. They had four plates at the dental uh, unit light and on the patient's chest. And they observed a large reduction in CFUs, in colonies, uh, at the light. Maybe this also shows that aerosol goes upwards and now it settles to the patient's chest. And believe it or not, the result was an overall from 90 to 98 percent reduction of the microbial contamination. It's unbelievable. So you may think it twice to use, if it's not the case, rubber dams. To finish, I want to, to spend a bit of time of air treatment. <clears throat> First, which are the applicable or linked standards. And here I'm not talking about devices, units, I'm talking about clean rooms and associated uh, areas as well. And I will classify areas in terms of cleanliness, or in other words, of concentration of airborne particles. This is not specific to dental. Uh, it can be laboratory, any uh, controlled environment. And this shows different classes from ISO 1 to ISO 9. And you see here, it uh, gives data on particles, the maximum amount of particles from 0.1 micron, so now remember the most penetrating particle size, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, up to 5 micron. Now, where is dental? Um, there's little, I must say, there's little documentation. But uh, I mean, in my country, in France, we would classify um, you know, dental practices, but especially uh, procedures generating uh, aerosols, like uh, scaling, you know, drilling, and uh, this would be classified as uh, ISO 7, AGP, airborne generating procedures, plus invasive uh, procedures. Normal treatment would be ISO 8. For example, in my country, uh, for um, uh, orthopedics in hospitals, they would classify in 7. But when it comes to prosthetics, then it's class 5. And do, they do not generate much aerosol. So roughly, uh, the lower the better. But let's focus on ISO 7. This is the uh, recommendation for or what we could compare uh, dental aerosol treatments uh, with this standard. What are the techniques? I can open the window. <laughs> no, let's be first with, uh, again, uh, let's say corresponding, not guidance, but uh, 
yeah, strong guidance from the World Health Organization. The important thing is to ventilate, yes, but uh, we talk in ACH, air change per hour. So how many times the air volume of the room is renewed? And WHO recommends a minimum air change of 12. So in one hour, the air volume will be changed 12 times. Stressing that uh, the type of room can be naturally or mechanically uh, ventilated, or there could be this could be an airflow, um, and of course, and of course, also uh, air removal for the open air. Some studies here, and uh, they have noticed that with one air change per hour it reduces the contamination by 63%. And every subsequent air change, again, removes 63% of the remainings. So basically, after five air changes, you are below 1% of the initial contamination level. This is very interesting. And thus, uh, the current UK COVID guidance, which I read, uh, recommend uh, 680H. Um, change and then again wait for one hour before entering without the respiratory protective equipment, without masks. I would still keep my mask to be honest. <clears throat> this is a recommendation in spaces um, which cannot uh, provide first ventilation and very important also a data um, a device or any expert that could confirm that when you open a window, this will, within a certain amount of time, renew 12 times the air in the room. It's difficult to measure, therefore, the recommendation is maybe to use also a HEPA, high particle filtration system, which is more appropriate. The graph here shows the number of hours, this is the, um, for the uh, particles to settle, and the number of air changes. Obviously, the higher, the better, um, the aerosol uh, removal time. Removal time uh, here. Air treatment techniques, ventilation. Obviously, where aerosol generating procedures, AGPs, occur, ventilation systems should provide at least 10 air changes per hour. You know, in my country, it's like uh, 15 or 12 to 15. Belgium would be 12, like Scotland, if I'm not mistaken. But at least minimum 10 air changes per hour. It's clear that um, if you have a natural ventilation, and here we talk about a window adapted big enough for the size of the room, but without any data, any figure that measures, confirms the number of air changes, then you cannot undertake AGPs in that room. <clears throat> it, it takes at least 15 to 30 minutes for droplets to settle. Uh, droplets of 10 micron take roughly 17 minutes to settle. So what happens, you would have to wait a very long time between patients. Patients and of course cleaning the room in between, cleaning and disinfecting. Techniques, mechanical supply ventilation. It's nothing else than a fan that is pushing fresh air into the room. Uh, the fan can be window mounted, wall mounted, or comes from ducted fans into the room. And obviously the compressed air must escape somewhere. It's, it's useless to have, a, 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 not to have an exhaust area which allow the air to go to the outside and be careful not um, that this air flows into uh, other areas of the practice, uh, like the waiting room or the reception, it is very dangerous. So we see now systems which also include an extract ventilation of two fans, one fan blowing air into the room and one fan discharging the air from the room to the outside. It's always nice, especially if you design a new uh, surgery, to seek advice from an expert, an architect who is really expert in ventilation. And usually these people will also be able to measure 
the number of air changes per hour. As I mentioned, two fans, of course, two different windows could be a solution. Opposite is even better because you would, you know, remove uh, better, mm, distribute the air inside the room with a window which is in the at the opposite, or you uh, use wall-mounted fans, but better also uh, um, uh, with a special insulation and uh, pipes. This ducted supply with extra fans. We talk about bigger units, and typically this will be installed by specialists. But you know that you have to challenge these guys. They must offer really guidance and evidence that the airflow the, will be appropriate for the size of the room. If it's not possible, you could simply think of a HEPA air handling system. What is it? It's this kind of device. It basically aspirates, filters, and redistributes the filter air into the room. They recycle the air, uh, but trapping um, the most of the particles. What is the rated standard? On filters, we have this uh, EN 1822. What does it say? It basically um, establishes a procedure which allows you to define the type of uh, filter you need or in which category the filter you are you know, using or producing belongs to. EPA stands for Efficient Particle Air. HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particle Air and ULPA, Ultra Low Penetration Air. So what does this, we talk about HEPA filters, and we talk about penetrating of the MPPS, most penetrating particle size, remember, from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 micron. We have two types of HEPA filters, which belong to two categories, you see H13, this filter will filter 99.95% of the uh, particles of that size. And H14, it's even better, 99.995. These local values, it's kind of values you could uh, negotiate, if I can say so, with your supplier, or let's say acceptable levels, but I would focus here on the integral values. That's what I want to achieve. In other words, H14 allows only if the machine breathes one liter of air, 50 particles of 0.1 micron to pass through the filter. And uh, H13, five, sorry, this is a mistake, it's the opposite. It's 5 and 50. I apologize for that. H14 is better, so it's 5 particles. H13 is 50 particles. Okay? It's, H14 is much better. Just to remind you what the FFP or N95 mask filters or N99, it's 94 to 99% of particles. This is 99.995. It's just a very means for keeping the environmental contamination very low in your, in your room. <clears throat> the machines look like this. You have uh, typically um, an intake carbon pre-filter a fan, and you have different uh, filtration modules. This machine here provides a, like a 3D uh, ventilation. It should be right in the middle of the room, and um, um, these filters uh, represent a surface of 18 square meter of uh, filters, HEPA filters. How can you choose your unit? My recommendation on choosing a unit. Obviously, compliance to the standard. H14 is even better. It shows on the certificate. Filtration at H14. And nice to have, or let's say it's a must, that the performance must be really uh, validated by the independent laboratory. And now very important, because it depends on the size of your room. The machine must be capable of renewing uh, 10 to 15 times the volume per hour. You know this uh, AC H per hour. Here we are. And this is very important. I will give you an example in a, in a second. It must be quiet because the fan must be absolutely quiet. 
And that's also important if you buy, a, let's say, two small device, it will run at full speed, so it will be noisier. Okay? Ease of use, movable, and easy to maintain. This is kind of obvious, and these machines are not so complicated. <clears throat> now, this example, if you want to measure, calculate if the machine is adapted to, your, to the size of your room, target, you remember, ISO 7, ISO 8 for the cleanliness. And this machine, for example, offers a maximum uh, volume, a boost mode, of 2,000 cubic meter per hour. Now, if I take 15 air change per hour, my room has 50 square meters, which is more or less 130 cubic meters, times 15 is close to 2,000. So this is the maximum capacity at full speed of that machine. If your room has only like 30 square meters, then you work at half the potential of the device, which is very nice. Bear in mind that when you enter the room and you switch on the device, it must go to full speed to quickly and drastically reduce the contamination. This device, for example, offers two modes, automatic or manual. You would set uh, 50 air changes per hour during daytime, and overnight, with no or low activity, you can reduce it to 10 air changes per night. Per hour, sorry. In this device, the filter lasts for four years. There is no maintenance, nothing to change prior to four years. So all these things are quite important when you choose a device. Now, you want to know <clears throat> what is the contamination. You know, you have to get data, you have to measure, and uh, there are such devices which are uh, wall-mounted. These machines will measure, laser count the particles. Every 10 seconds, it will intake one liter of air and measure and distribute, as you see in the picture, the number of particles of each size. You give uh, the target to the device. I want ISO 7. Uh, in this case, uh, it's not the case because the machine has not yet reached ISO 7. So we sh it shows it's in the red area here. And it will also indicate the values. This is the, uh, the table I showed before. This concerns cubic meters. So just remove three zeros and you see the number of particles um, here, 352 of this size. You see here there are 1058, so it's not yet uh, achieved. So it shows ISO 8, and when the machine is going to run and run and run, and finally reach ISO 7, the machine will display it. So it's quite nice and makes you feel really safe. Alternative methods, uh, there are not so many. And this is one uh, recent um, paper from the National Research of Safe and Safety Institute for Prevention of Work Accidents and Occupational Diseases. This is a French uh, um, institute. They claim that only HEPA machines with HEPA filters of minimum age 13, this is the minimum class, are effective to stop um, viruses which are obviously on, on uh, particles. And for any other technology, you should ask for evidence. I mean, the supplier should provide you evidence that any system is um, compatible with uh, viruses and other, we talk about virus because these are kind of the smallest nano-sized particles, so in, um, uh, microorganisms. And be careful, this is also mentioned here, that uh, if, if they use chemicals or any other means than just filtering air, uh, you might have some uh, incomplete degradation of pollutants, and this is quite uh, impacting the uh, air quality, and not to say that some compounds are potentially dangerous for health, including CMR, this is carcinogenic, mutagenic, and neurotoxic substance. So be really careful and just don't just take something that looks magic, but ask for evidence, which is a must for manufacturers to supply to provide any data on the offered device. So now I have a look if we have questions.
Yeah, all our videos are available on our video channel. I really invite you to um, go on www.dabinch.com and really check. Um, we have a lot of information, like a library on different topics, um, which is very interesting uh, for you. And you can download the video at any time or watch them at any time. No questions? If there are questions, I invite you to uh, drop them on my email address, christian.stamp at stamish.com. And uh, I think um, we are at the end of the presentation. I thank you very much for joining us today and hope to see you soon. Bye bye.